Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. On May 20th, 1999, police in Snowtown, a small town in South Australia, opened up the vault of an old abandoned bank. An officer walked in and immediately began to gag. She was rushed out before she might have contaminated the crime scene. The vault was littered with knives, handcuffs, all sorts of instruments of torture and violence. Lined up against the back wall of the vault were six barrels, the clear source of the foul stench that sent the officer reeling. Inside the barrels were the dismembered remains of eight people tortured, murdered, and stuffed into the containers. The officers were not wholly surprised to find a body there. They had entered the bank on the trail of a missing persons case. What shocked them was the number of bodies. Who had done this? Who was responsible for one of the greatest series of murders in Australian history? Thanks to the man who had directed them to the bank vault, Police already had two names, John Bunting and Robert Wagner. We get support from June's Journey. Escape to a bygone age of mystery, danger, and romance as you immerse yourself in the world of June's Journey. Play as June Parker and investigate beautifully detailed scenes of the 1920s while uncovering the mystery of her sister's murder. With hundreds of mind-teasing puzzles, the next clue is always within reach. I'm always excited to complete each chapter to see where the storyline takes me. It's immersing and engaging, but still a great way to relax at the end of the day. Discover your inner detective when you download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. We get support from Audible. Looking for something new to listen to? Check out Audible, the home of audio entertainment. With Audible, you'll always find the best of what you love or something new to discover, like a guided wellness program or an Audible original. Plus, the Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere. If you're into true crime, and you certainly are if you're listening to this program, think about my book, Special Agent, My Life on the Front Lines as a Woman in the FBI. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche. I was a psychiatric nurse, and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is John Bunting and Robert Wagner. In 1989, Wagner and Bunting met in Adelaide, Australia. They immediately discovered they shared a bond in their hatred of pedophiles. They were both unemployed when they first met, 
So they would spend most of their days watching TV, drinking coffee, and plotting. Bunting and Wagner's partnership found its first victim in 1992. The year before, a 17-year-old drifter named Clinton had stayed with Wagner and his partner, Vanessa Lane. Bunting took an immediate dislike to Clinton, who he assumed was a pedophile, nicknamed Happy Pants. With Lane and Wagner's help, Bunting lured Clinton to his home, where he snuck up behind the younger man as he sat on the couch and bashed his skull with a shovel. Then, Wagner and Bunting took Clinton's body to a nearby town where they buried him in a shallow grave. This was the first overtly violent act in Bunting and Wagner's vigilantism. Before Clinton's murder, they would harass those they felt were pedophiles, homosexuals, or obese. But we'll get to that later. For the three years after the murder of Clinton, they toned down the violence and opted instead for intimidating suspected local predators rather than outright murder them. They would vandalize homes, shout at people in the street, and make threats to people they suspected of being pedophiles. During one of their intimidation campaigns, Bunting met Elizabeth Harvey, whose three sons were being harassed and assaulted by a neighbor. Elizabeth fell for Bunting immediately. Despite the fact that both of them were already married, the two began spending almost every day together. Eventually, Bunting kicked out his first wife, Veronica, and had Elizabeth and her children move in with him. Her second son, Jamie, took a particular liking to Bunting. At 14 years old, Jamie saw Bunting as the first dependable father figure in his life. Bunting was his hero. He was the man who drove off the neighbor who was his tormentor and rapist. And Bunting encouraged Jamie's resentment his desire for revenge for what had happened to him. Eventually, Bunting showed Jamie his, quote, rock spider wall, where he collected evidence, in his opinion, of local pedophiles he planned to murder. In December of 1995, Bunting's plans for murder turned into action when he and Wagner kidnapped and murdered Ray Davies. Davies lived in a mobile home behind the house of their neighbor, Suzanne. According to Suzanne's daughter, Davies was a pedophile, acting inappropriately and trying to seduce Suzanne's grandchildren. And that was the only thing Bunting and Wagner needed to hear. They drove him out to a nearby small town where they forced him into a farmhouse bathtub and beat him. Then they drove him back to Bunning's house where Elizabeth helped them torture and strangle him with jumper cables. They buried Davies in Bunting's backyard with the help of Mark Hayden, another neighbor who had become a willing participant in Bunting and Wagner's vigilantism. Almost a year later, Suzanne Allen, remember her? She disappeared. Bunting claimed that he and Wagner found her after she had a heart attack. But instead of calling the police, the pair decided to dispose of her body in the same makeshift grave as Ray Davies. They also began collecting her pension to fund their murderous activities. Well, that explains why they didn't call the police. She may have had a heart attack, yeah, while they were torturing her to death. In September of 1997, Bunting and Wagner killed a transgender woman who Wagner claimed was a pedophile. The following month, 
the duo murdered Wagner's ex-partner, Vanessa. Both as revenge for her sexual abuse of him, Wagner, and to tie up the loose end that she had witnessed the murder of Clinton. Then they recruited Vanessa's current partner, Thomas, to help in the torture. And let me explain to you what I mean by her partners. Both of these men, when they were young adolescent boys at different times, had been kidnapped by Vanessa and sexually abused by her for many years. Confused? I sure was. But let me unravel it for you. When Wagner was a young adolescent, Vanessa kidnapped him and kept him with her, abusing him sexually for years. Then he leaves, and she kidnaps Thomas, who was also an adolescent at the time, and keeps him in her, well, lair, abusing him sexually as well. It's easy to see why they bore tremendous hatred towards her. Now, about Thomas, just one month later, he was telling people about the murder of Vanessa. So to stop him from talking, they kidnapped him and staged a suicide, tying a noose around his neck and hanging him from a tree. Because he had a history of mental illness and suicide attempts, no one was the wiser. Starting in April of 1998, Bunting and Wagner killed three more men with the aid of Bunting's stepson, Jamie, and fellow vigilante, Mark Hayden. This included Jamie's half-brother, Troy, who had sexually abused him, Jamie, when Jamie was only 13. The other two men were suspected of being gay, which was all Bunting and Wagner needed to believe to kill them. They were tortured for their financial information before they were killed and placed into the barrels at the bank vault. In November of 1998, Mark Hayden started talking about his involvement in the murders to his wife, Elizabeth. Guess who became the next victim? She did. Elizabeth's disappearance troubled the police especially when her husband did not seem concerned about his wife's whereabouts. Secondly, when the police asked her neighbors and friends where she might have gone, Robert Wagner told them that she had left after getting rejected by his friend, John Bunting. With information from previous missing persons investigations, police put together that Bunting and Wagner were the last two people to see both Elizabeth Hayden and Vanessa Lane alive. When they started asking questions, Bunting and Wagner scrambled to move all the evidence out of their houses, especially the barrels with their victims' bodies in Bunting's shed. They rented a foreclosed bank branch in Snowtown a small township to the north of Adelaide. And in the middle of the night, they transferred all the barrels to the vault. Despite all the scrutiny from police, Bunting did not stop. He convinced Jamie to lure his stepbrother, David Johnson, to the Snowtown vault. There was no evidence that Johnson was a pedophile, but Bunting told his accomplices that, well, He needed to die anyway. On May 9th, 1999, Jamie and David arrived at the vault where Bunting and Wagner jumped him, handcuffed him, and tortured him for his financial information. David Johnson was the only victim to actually die in Snowtown. Only 11 days later, on May 20th, a friend of Bunting's who knew what he was up to led police to the vault and the bodies in the barrels. That friend lived across the street from the vault, and Bunting had stored the barrels in his driveway 
before renting the bank building. The police arrested Bunting, Wagner, and Hayden the next morning. A few days later, Jamie, ridden with guilt, contacted a lawyer and confessed his involvement, offering to help the police and be a witness for the prosecution. They called him the Miracle Man. Based on the hit Wondery podcast, Peacock's Dr. Death dives into the breathtaking true story of Dr. Paolo Macchiarini, whose groundbreaking surgeries were set to revolutionize medicine forever. When a trail of tragedy and deception follow in his wake, a journalist and a group of doctors race to uncover the truth that Paolo Macchiarini might just be more mirage than miracle. Starring Edgar Ramirez and Mandy Moore, Dr. Death is streaming December 21st, only on Peacock. Who wants to fuss with inserting a card into a reader, or worse, into a skimmer, where your card information can be stolen? Instead, pay the Apple way. Apple Pay is easy, secure, and built into iPhone. All you have to do is set it up. Just add a card in the Wallet app and you're good to go. John Justin Bunting was born in 1966 to Jan and Tom Bunting of Inala, Queensland. Bunting was a curious child, interested in chemistry and physics. He was also often at odds with his parents, especially his mother. Jan kept her house a very rigid environment, which Bunting resisted and resented from a young age. His own room was not private for him, and she frequently entered it to clean and do whatever she wanted. In fact, she was desperate to keep it clean. Some would say obsessive. Bunting learned from an early age how to keep secrets from his parents. But that's what can happen when parents are too strict, emotionally unavailable and demanding kids don't develop a sense of safety with them. When Bunting was eight years old, he went to a friend's house. The friend had an older brother, a teenager, who tied both younger boys down and sexually assaulted them, beating them whenever they would make a sound. After he was finally released, Thanks to his abuser's father walking in, Bunting walked home and received a scolding for being late for dinner. When his mother asked about his bruises, he told her he fell off his bike. That doesn't surprise me at all that young John Bunting remained silent about the rape, and that's what it was. Because it's not at all uncommon that young children think that if something bad happened to them, they will be blamed for having brought it on themselves, especially in strict religious households. The message they receive is, if you are good, God will protect you. But if you are not good, well then, bad things will happen to you. Kids that are victimized think, I must have done something wrong for this to have happened to me. But being beaten and sodomized by a much older teenager is not only physically, but psychologically traumatizing. If your child is normally happy, interacts well with everybody in the family, takes care of their pets, their toys, things like that, and that suddenly stops, if they start wetting the bed after they've been toilet trained for a long time, or if they lose their appetite, or sometimes children that have been victimized sexually put on weight at a rapid rate. They can't eat enough. Those are all symptoms, signs, that a child is disturbed. For many years, Bunting told no one about the horrible experience. 
This is common in young boys. They are embarrassed for many reasons to admit that another male got the better of them, especially sexually, and that they could not get away or fight back. Being overpowered makes them feel helpless. That's totally understandable. And feeling helpless can, and it certainly did in this case, lead to a desire for the child to want to destroy either himself or someone else. The fear a child has during the assault of being sexually abused is dangerously intense. So much so that for some child victims, it is the beginning of severe psychiatric disorders, multiple personality disorder being one of them. The rates of substance abuse, depression, and suicide are much higher for them than their peers who have not suffered a sexual attack. The aftermath of damage to a rape victim's psyche is called rape trauma syndrome, a group of symptoms and behaviors identified first by Dr. Ann Burgess, professor of psychiatric nursing at the University of Pennsylvania, and whom we featured in a case that Ann and I worked together in season one of Killer Psyche, Brian Dugan. Professional intervention for a victim experiencing rape trauma syndrome is essential for a successful recovery. But Bunting, he didn't get help. He suffered in silence. The physical and verbal domination combined with sexual brutality is overwhelming, way too much so for a kid to handle on their own. Young John Bunning festered in his own shame, and his resentment grew. It became a toxic stew of emotions, which only served to damage his psyche. And in this case, it set the stage for a life of violent crime. He developed a profound hatred for gay men and those he viewed as pedophiles. I want to be clear here, the vast majority of child molestations, and that's kind of a nice word to describe what really happened to John, it was way more than a molestation. The vast majority of them are perpetrated by heterosexual men on an opposite sex victim. However, it is a widely regarded myth, unfortunately it is, that gay men are also pedophiles. They are not. They are two distinctly different things. One is a crime perpetrated against a minor, usually by a heterosexual person. The other is a sexual orientation, plain and simple. The two have nothing to do with each other. Now, does that mean a homosexual person cannot be a pedophile? No, it does not. But pedophilia is a clinical term, and it means the individual can be male or female, can be hetero or homosexual, are physically aroused at the thought or sight of a prepubescent child. That's what they're attracted to. That is what it means to be a pedophile. John Bunting child crime victim became John Bunting, adult crime victimizer. At 13 years old, Bunting met a man named Benny. Benny was much older. He was in his 40s, but John trusted him. Together, the pair lashed out. Bunting would stand on street corners waiting for older men to make a pass at him. Then he would lure them into alleyways where Benny was waiting to beat them. It was his first taste of violence, and he liked it. He liked it a lot. When he was 17 years old, 
Bunting got his then-girlfriend, Lisa, pregnant, but he did not know it. After they broke up, his ex had their daughter, a little girl named Tammy. Lisa and the baby left for England. Bunting never saw Lisa again or the daughter he never knew. When Bunting was 18, he left Queensland. With Lisa and Tammy gone and Benny dead from throat cancer, there was nothing keeping him there. He moved to Adelaide with a friend, taking odd jobs and building a collection of guns, poisons, knives, and other instruments of violence. In January of 1989, Bunting met a woman named Veronica in his welding class. Within months, the two of them were married and moved to a different area of Adelaide where Bunting met Wagner. As the two men got to know each other, they discovered they shared a murderous hatred of certain types of people and shared a common thread of anger and cruelty. Bunting worked at a nearby slaughterhouse where he actually delighted in the deaths of sheep and other livestock, meaning he caused their death. But it was not a new feeling for him. He had a history of animal cruelty, even having killed a roommate's dog in his early adulthood. Who does that? Well, a future real bad problem. Wagner, on the other hand, was a white supremacist who idolized Hitler going so far as to name his dog, you guessed it, Adolf. The two men also shared a history of childhood sexual abuse. When they met, Wagner was in a relationship with a convicted pedophile and transgender woman. Her name was Vanessa Lane. He was in a relationship with her that started when Wagner was only 14 and Lane was 31. Actually, he was her victim. John Bunting didn't just do horrible things himself. He had a whole cadre of Confederates to support and join him. If you're a student of serial killers, and I'm guessing many of you are, then you know it's highly unusual for serial killers to work with the partner, let alone two or three of them. Additionally, most serial killers are motivated by a long-standing fantasy that usually involves sexual assault, domination, control, humiliation, and in this case, a whopping dose of sadism. Now, the most important part of what I just said for most serial killers is the sexually driven fantasy. However, in this case, Bunting, though without question undeniably a sadist, is motivated out of the need for domination, power, and control over his victim and revenge. That is very unusual for serial killers, though not unheard of. But for John, it was everything. Early on in his killing career, Bunting would select a name and picture from the wall photos of people he kept in his home. He'd pick one to be his next victim. Then he'd call and threaten them insinuating they were pedophiles and, quote, would get what's coming to them. That is revenge with a capital R. According to Dale Kushner, author of The Conditions of Love, in an article published in Psychology Today, November of 2023, Revenge typically involves the desire to inflict harm, suffering, or punishment in response to a perceived wrong. 
and often include strong emotions like anger or a desire for personal satisfaction. She goes on to say that the purpose of revenge is to redress a perceived injury and punish the perpetrator. According to Peg Streep, the author of an article on revenge in the July 2017 issue of Psychology Today, quote, for most of us, acting vengefully never gets past the fantasy stage. Our rational mind kicks in along with our moral compass and perhaps our fear of continued reprisal. While we may be angry, we choose instead to move on with our lives, either in full stride or with a noticeable limp. John Bunting is obviously not in the category of the most of us she is talking about. To me, the big question is, does exacting revenge work? Does it give us satisfaction and make us feel better? According to Kushner, no, it does not. Quote, behavioral studies indicate an act of revenge does not grant the satisfaction the individual is seeking, but rather it sets up cycles of rumination and ongoing distress. She goes on to say that fantasizing about revenge may be tremendously gratifying, but psychologists observe that acting out revenge does not diminish feelings of animosity at all and can even prolong the Avenger's reaction to the original offense. Nor does it automatically lead to catharsis or closure. Instead, it invites continued brooding and dissatisfaction. Increased rumination sets the stage for retribution and more cycles of aggression. Okay, now I'm 100% sure that just described John Bunting to a T. If we are to believe that Bunting developed an intense hatred for homosexuals and pedophiles, based on being violated as a young boy, that certainly helps explain his victim pool, or at least most of it. I think what started out for John, what serial killers call taking out the trash, that's his point of view, not mine, it got way out of control. He enjoyed the actual killing part, the long, drawn-out torture of his victims, making them pay for the sins of someone else. In this case, the older teenager who raped him. Bunting created and then carried out his own brand of vigilante justice, organizing the torture and deaths of so-called sex offenders. At first, he targeted known child molesters and gay men. But sometimes these people were labeled so based on rumor and innuendo. After a while, he turned his murderous intentions to disabled and drug-addicted people as well as obese people. He saw them as weak or a waste, and therefore they were worthy of extinction by him. Most of the victims had some kind of association with at least one member of Bunting's close-knit group. Some of them were family members who shared a residence with one of the murderers. Some of the victims were targeted for the sole purpose of death. They'd find themselves befriended for a short time, be pulled into the group, then murdered. In short, Anyone who got anywhere near John Bunting might find themselves in a barrel, literally. To say Bunting was a psychopath is a profound understatement. The hallmark of a psychopath is the inability to feel empathy, guilt, or remorse for anyone. That's why it's so easy for them to kill over and over. Think about it. If they felt bad about it, and some killers 
do feel bad when they kill someone, they would not repeat that behavior. Fortunately, most people that ever do kill anyone else do not become serial killers. But Bunting was way more than just a straight-up psychopath. He was also a sadist. He enjoyed the physical and emotional suffering of others. It made him feel good and gave him a sense of satisfaction. During the torture phase of their murder, Bunting's victims were forced to call him God, Master, Chief Inspector, and Lord Sir. There is such a creature as a sexual sadist, but there's no information that John received sexual pleasure from hurting others. I'd say in his case, Bunting was also afflicted with sadistic personality disorder, as many serial killers are. According to the DSM-3 from 20 years ago, the diagnostic criteria sadistic personality disorder is defined by a pervasive pattern of sadistic and cruel behavior that begins in early adulthood. Now, that diagnosis, sadistic personality disorder, was removed from the DSM because psychiatrists believe, and wisely, I might add, it would be used to legally excuse sadistic behavior. Nevertheless, these are just a few of the traits that did define it. First, the individual has used physical cruelty or violence for the purpose of establishing dominance in a relationship, humiliates or demeans people in the presence of others. Second, the individual has treated or disciplined someone under his or her control unusually harshly. Third, they are amused by or take pleasure in the psychological or physical suffering of others, including animals. Fourth, they have lied for the purpose of harming or inflicting pain on others not merely to achieve some other goal. Fifth, they get other people to do what he or she wants by frightening them through intimidation or even terror. Sixth, they restrict the autonomy of people with whom he or she has a close relationship. For example, they will not let their spouse leave the house unaccompanied or permit their teenage daughter to attend social functions. And lastly, and this fits, they are fascinated by violence, weapons, injury, or torture. Sound like anyone we've been talking about? If you read more about this case on your own, you're going to see that John and his group of accomplices also robbed people, their victims, of their pensions. That is true. Upon the death of his victims, John misappropriated their pensions to his own wallet. But make no mistake, his unjust enrichment was in no way the motivating force behind these murders. It was simply a plus. It was secondary to the act of torture and murder not the cause of it. Over many years of interacting with rape victims, both as a psychiatric nurse in my FBI cases and the 36 people I interviewed in prison that had been convicted of murder, I can tell you assuredly that not getting them professional help after the assault and thinking, let's just not talk about it and they will just forget is not a good approach to handling the aftermath. Can a victim of rape fully recover without help? Possibly. But sooner or later, residual problems will probably surface and very likely affect their life. As we saw with John Bunting in this story, those unresolved fears, anger and resentment and bitterness 
all of those things can surface and destroy future relationships and possibly their own life. I also think it's important to point out here that though John started out killing pedophiles, his victim pool eventually spread out to pretty much anyone that he deemed had no right to live. He killed a disabled teenager. He killed an obese person, not because they had wronged him in any way, but because he thought they were weak. However, I question as to whether it's that simple. I think there's a greater likelihood that he was simply really enjoying the killing. Remember, he's a sadist to the core, and therefore causing people to suffer and then killing them would be a real payday for him. I think this whole, I only killed the bad ones, cloak of self-righteousness is nothing more than that. A cover for his murderous intentions toward, well, basically anyone. Had he not been caught, I don't think there would have been enough body bags in Australia to deal with his crimes. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes from the world's best? Easily hundreds to thousands of dollars. But with a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Learn how to negotiate a raise with Chris Voss or manage your relationships with Esther Perel. It's like Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. This holiday season, give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash Wondery. Right now, you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash Wondery. Masterclass.com slash Wondery. Offer terms apply. Thanks to Jamie's statement, the prosecution in the case of the Snowtown murders had enough evidence to connect Bunting and his crew to 12 murders. But sifting through all Jamie's lengthy statement and collecting all the necessary evidence took a couple of years, so the trial did not start until 2002. The trial was very lengthy. It took 11 months with a total of 227 witnesses taking the stand. The court decided only to try Bunting and Wagner together. Jamie had already pled guilty to four murders and was sentenced to 26 years in prison. His mother, Elizabeth, died of cancer before the trials began. Mark Hayden, on the other hand, was tried separately as he was only an accomplice on most of the murders. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison with a minimum of 18 years before he could apply for parole. Wagner pled guilty to three counts, the murders of Vanessa, Fred, and David. In the end, he was found guilty in seven others and he was given 10 life sentences. Bunting pled not guilty to every charge he was given. That doesn't surprise me. That's a classic psychopath move. Oh, you think you got me? Prove it. Well, they did. He was convicted of 11 of the 12 murders he was charged with. Authorities were never able to definitively connect him to the death of Suzanne Allen he was given 11 life sentences. After his sentencing, Bunting stood defiantly and tried to justify his actions, saying that pedophiles were terrorizing his community and authorities did nothing to stop them. In 2017, Mark Hayden was denied parole. All four members of Bunting's gang are still alive and in prison. Mm -hmm. 
From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Additional writing and director of research is Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corpy and Matt Dyson. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Wachnin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are myself, Candace DeLong, Kelly Garner, and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Well, hello, ladies and germs, boys and girls. I've been given the honor of hosting a new podcast. That's right, me, your illustrious host, The Grinch. I've sent every late-night show host packing, and instead I'm here to make the who's who of Hollywood cry boo-hoo. I'm calling it, Cindy. Just hit end. Just hit end on the Zoom. <laughs> I'm done with this guy. I mean, seriously. And you can listen with the whole family as these ridiculous celebrities try to persuade me there's anything good about the insufferable holiday season. Please welcome Megan Trainer. Hi. I'm so honored to be here. The American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes. I think we're friends, you and I. Bob and Aaron Nunder. Are you okay, sir? Oh. Deep breaths. <sighs> I'm sorry, I'm good. So tune in and turn up the volume for a hilariously bad time. Follow Tis the Grinch Holiday Talk Show on the Wondry app or wherever you get your podcasts.